being gay wasn't that attractive or that accepted in those days. It was okay to be gay. Uh, Rock Hudson always did it better than anybody. And Tap Hunter. They never emphasized that. You would want, I mean, I worked for Rock Hudson for about three years in a PR firm and we handled him. And he'd go to parties and these really attractive guys would, uh, young beach boys types, would be kind of clustered around him trying to get his focus. He would never flirt with them. He would never, you know, he, there was no like contact at all. He played it very straight. And then he would go home and have a party, a gay party at his house and have all of his gay friends around. The industry knew he was never gonna embarrass them by being, by being gay or making them think they'd been duped by him, that he wasn't a heterosexual actor after all. But it wasn't something that uh, people minded as long as you didn't emphasize it. They were not shy about hiring him or, you know, in essence, getting in bed with him work-wise if he could make the money. That was the, the guiding factor always. I mean, it was like Noel Coward. You know, I think everybody knew certainly he was gay and he never kind of covered that up, but he made money for people and he was a brilliant writer and his plays were very successful and audiences loved Noel Coward and what he had to say. But uh, that, that made the difference. People criticize Isherwood and Don McCarty because they weren't really out there and the, after Stonewall, they changed later and became, um, but it's, it's the times. And, and I, you know, I lived in Hollywood closet in the 60s as the lover of a world famous Oscar winning director. And we, uh, I was terrified to go to Hollywood parties. It just wasn't done to bring your gay lover or your partner in those days. And I said, can't you just take, um, you know, some Julie Christie with Can't you just take, you know, Lauren Bacall? Can't you just take Lee Remick? I don't want to go. I mean, I, I, said, I said, no, I'm proud of our relationship. I want you to go to these Academy things and uh, terrifying things like these black tie dinners at Rosalind Russell's. And I mean, I mean, I was, I, you know, I was 23 years old and uh, the world wasn't out. And um, much discredit, and I that John insisted that w we be there. From around 1975 to around 1979, you know, many people weren't out at all, you know. But those in Hollywood knew who was gay and who wasn't gay, and, you know, a lot of the men. I was just telling somebody this morning that I used to go to Oscar de Laurentiis' house with his wife, Francois, in 1972 with Kitty, and I would always be seated next to Mrs. Onassis, and they were very grand parties, and all the men were in black tie with their women. And then at the end of the dinner, the men would escort their wives or girlfriends home, and then we would all meet at the Continental Baths. Every single man. <laughs> when I first came out, I was in San Francisco. I was in college, and I remember going into the Castro, and there was one particular bar that over the door, it said, no fats or femmes need come in. That was the kind of mentality we were dealing with. The Marlboro Man was the, was the personification of male ideal. Plaid shirt, very muscled, you know, sleeves rolled up, your Levi's, kind of looking like Jack Wrangler. In fact, Jack Wrangler, Jack told me, I used my look as the Marlboro look. It was based a little on Tom of Finland, but mostly on cigarette ads. And that was what we called in the gay community of, of San Francisco the clone look. The most notorious bathhouse in the area was the 8709, which was notorious and famous. And you, it, it, the phone number was, was not published. No one knew the phone number. They had a phone, but no one ever knew the number. And when I first started going there, you know how you got in? You would go up to the door and you'd lift your, your, your shirt. And if you didn't have a six pack or if you had any kind of body fat at all, they had to, mm, well, you're not two yet. You know, I went there for like three years until finally <laughs> one day I didn't have, I didn't have the, the chest for it anymore. It was all discriminatory. Studio One started off as a, as a, a, 
a straight dinner club that you had to pay a lot of money to belong to. And every time you went, you paid to get in, and then they would serve dinner and so on. And it, it, it lasted for quite a while, and it became a kind of passé. And so on Sunday afternoon, Scott Forbes, who was also an eye doctor, as I am, um, would take it over and um, make a tea dance evening or afternoon for the gay community. And it got busier and busier and busier, and finally he thought, well, let's do Tuesday nights, and maybe we'll do hump night on Wednesday. And pretty quick, he filled up every night, and the, and the, uh, the dinner you know, events that were there for the straighter community that belonged to it sort of fell away, and he took it over, and it became Studio One. The Odyssey was a huge disco in the vein of you know, discos of the late 70s. It was a huge club, huge dance floor, many different rooms, many different bars. The Odyssey only served juice and soft drinks, but, um, which was fine because there was ample drugs available, be it acid, quaaludes, MDA, coke, whatever. So it was like a brand new world. I mean, I would walk in and somebody just pop something in my mouth. I didn't know what it was. I said, just great, let's, let's do it. It just felt so good that it, you know, like I said, it really could just kind of consumed my whole world at that point in my late teens and early 20s because it just finally I was free and around like-minded people or like or people who were like me that we could just kind of celebrate and have fun together. It was a little conclave in West Hollywood. There was Studio One run by Scott Forbes. There was International Mail, which was a, a, a fashion house for men, but mainly gay men, and Phyllis Morris furnishings. And they were all within that little area around Lapeer and Santa Monica. And each one fed off the other. Scott Forbes would get a lot of his bar boys and bus boys and bartenders from thumbing through the pages of International Mail's catalog. I actually went out with one named Randy Jones, not of the village people, his name was Randy Jones, I'll never forget him. He had kind of reddish, a reddish afro and he was beautiful. People were doing a lot of drugs. I can't tell you how much cocaine enters into film production, going out and partying, picking up dates, everything was based on how much blow you were doing. And you would go to parties and it would literally be either in on tables laid out, they would have like glass or mylar tables, or a, a famous way of doing it that I recall was someone would say, you should go in the bathroom. And you would go in the bathroom and shut the door and you'd look and over would be a little mirror and it would have the little lines out that you were being allocated for that, for that particular, it was so common. You know, I never bought cocaine. I would, I, first of all, I couldn't afford it, and secondly, it was, it was always around. You know, it was like something that you just didn't have to think about ever scoring for yourself, you know, especially if you were in a party circuit. 